All right, let's get started. So my name is Ryan Stroop, and I work out of the PG&E Energy Centers in Northern California. Uh, I coordinate our classes on building commissioning, energy audits and measurements, and the series on fault detection and diagnostic tools is um, aligned with the classes we offer on uh, building commissioning topics. Uh, we did a class in the fall, which was sort of an overview of FDD and these demonstrations are a follow up to that. So if you're curious about the class held last year, you can find it on our uh, learning platform as a on demand module. So we have a disclaimer. Um, well, I'm not going to read through that, but I have to show it. And then we also want to acknowledge that this is being recorded and the recording will be available also on our on demand platform. The um, first of these recordings from um, late, um, actually late January and February are starting to show up in the platform. If you want to search for those, just search for FDD in the search tool on our learning platform and you'll find the rec uh, first recordings that are available. Um, and if you miss the end of this session, because we'll go over a little bit for Q&A, you can always go back and watch the recording to see the answer to your question. So I need to talk about safety. We have to um, emphasize that very important topic at PG&E. Um, as far as attending today, make sure you have a egress path. And in case your first path is blocked, you have a second means out. Um, can happen in earthquake country where debris falls in your, your intended exit path and you have to take your other path. So two exit paths required. Set up a place where you're going to meet um, whoever you're working with or residing with. Uh, make sure that's sort of you know understood and rehearsed in advance. Um, have a go bag prepared. It would include essentials like short supply of food and water, um, first aid kit, flashlight with working batteries, medicines, pet food, critical documents sealed in a plastic bag, radio. You can Google go bag to get a full list. Um, in case the building starts to shake, it may be an earthquake, you're to duck, cover, and hold, go under your desk, wait for the building to stop shaking before you surface. Do not exit the building because you could be in the path of falling glass. Um, certainly an, an issue where I'm located in uh, Northern California. Um, the pandemic is ongoing, so remember to continue to wash your hands, wear a face mask in public, and maintain social distance. I know these standards are changing a little bit, but our advice uh, continues to be to maintain the safety protocols. And then finally, this is a short hour, hour and 15 minute presentation, but if you need to take a break, stand and stretch, by all means do that. So this um, series was cross promoted through the California chapter of the Building Co uh, Commissioning Association, a professional organization focused on building commissioning. Um, I wanna thank them for helping us get the word out about the series. You can, um, Join the chapter if you're interested and involved in the commissioning field. We welcome uh, new members. Um, this is the schedule you're looking at now, and we are into the first week there of March. So after today, we will only have three sessions left, one tomorrow and, and then two next week. Um, but if again, if you missed any of these, they will be available on our on-demand platform. Um, just remember to search for FDD fault detection and diagnostics when you're in the search uh, tool. So um, I mentioned the recordings for questions. We're gonna hold questions till the end. Um, the questions um, you know, are, are certainly encouraged, but um, we'll, and we'll take extra time. We'll go about 50 minutes over today to address your questions. And also uh, Stephen's slides are included in the handouts part of the dashboard. You can grab those um, now, they're already there for you. And I just made Stephen the presenter so he'll bring up his screen as I read his, um, I see your screen already, Stephen. So Stephen Crow is responsible for helping customers ensure their buildings are properly integrated with Resolute's building performance analytics and reporting software to deliver maximum and expedited value in owning the solution. Stephen also plays a key role in product development, combining his industry knowledge, direct customer feedback, and day-to-day hands-on experience using the software to drive solution improvements and future requirements. Prior to choosing Resolute, Stephen spent more than a decade in the construction and property management industries, more recently managing operations for several large commercial and industrial properties. 
Stephen has extensive experience integrating and configuring the Resolute software for a variety of clients, including public Chicago Public Schools, Trinity Health, and others. Stephen, I see you. I see your slides. If I hear your voice, you're good to go. Beautiful. Thanks very much for the introduction, Ryan. And uh, thanks everyone for attending. Um, I just want to set the stage a little bit more with, with what Ryan gave around my background. Um, I don't have years and years of experience in a BAS systems. I don't have years and years and years of engineering experience looking at buildings and how they operate. I come more from a managerial background. And so uh, a lot of what you guys are going to see today relates back to the people that are actually operating in the buildings and why I believe that that's where we really need to start with the data. Uh, and, and why you're going to see a lot of the focus on this presentation being around how do we capture this information and give the data back to the people that can actually do something about it in, in regards to like the building technicians, owners, managers, things of that nature. Um, so with that, you guys are seeing my first slide and obviously I'm missing some big opportunities here with Stephen, your your voice dropped out for me. Oh, it, yeah, it muted me. I'm sorry. How's that? Is is it back? It, it, and only the last sentence needs to be repeated. Okay. Here, let me uh, go back up a slide there. Just, just a quick joke around how I uh, I don't have my engineering cap and my train whistle yet, um, which is supposed to be in place in time for this. And I was supposed to have the background music of that old 90s song, Come on, Ride That Train, but that was voted down due to lack of professionalism. I think that's the end of my jokes, but we'll find out. There might be more. Um, I tend to do that, so we'll see. Um, uh, so what we're going to be talking about is using the data that you already have to try and navigate the modern building environment. Just start off with a little quote from uh, Edwards Deming, if any of you have heard of him. He's kind of known as a data guru. Uh, In God we trust, all others we bring data. Um, what that basically alludes to is that Hey, I can trust a lot, um, but I'm, I'm going to need data for it to be fact in my world. So I want to talk a little bit about building and what the expectations are within buildings. Um, anybody that's been in the industry for some time can probably relate to the idea that uh, it's no longer all about comfort. Comfort is king was a statement that I've always made and I still believe holds true. Um, most initiatives and things that happen within a building are all going to be really dependent on tenants being comfortable. But now we see two other components that are becoming more and more prevalent. Sustainability, obviously, uh, now we're having different things around uh, green initiatives, zero carbon, all those different types of things. Uh, and additionally, we have different things around health and indoor air quality. And what I like to relate this back to is the primary concern for people operating buildings has almost always been comfort. Um, and I relate that back through experience and through the data that we see coming across our product. So now we're expecting those people that were really dependent on, on very little uh, technology to maintain comfort. Now with no additional tools, we're saying, now you have to track sustainability and you better track the health. You, you need to have answers for all these different types of things. What that also leads into is how complex buildings are getting and how our tools that we're giving to the people operating the buildings have really not improved that much uh, and that they're, they're still pretty much where they have been for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, we have a lot of IoT advances in networking. So we're seeing a lot of different, uh, even just in general, networks popping up that have supposedly different types of data and information that we need. Um, smart building technology adoption is happening everywhere. And then I'm sure anybody here that has any type of a career in this type of field has seen many emails talking about all these new sensors that they need within the building uh, and how easy they are to install. Um, but how do you kind of navigate all that stuff? So. What this also goes in line with is that demands within buildings are rising quite a bit. Um, it goes beyond just the sustainability. It goes beyond just the health, but it's just do more with less budget, do more with fewer resources. And it's we don't even care what, just do more, do it better and faster. And I, I really like this slide um, because anybody that has been within buildings, um, the people that are that are you know paid to operate buildings, uh, properly, they're not judged based on how well they're properly operating that building. And I say that because there's no real KPIs when you enter a building that says, okay, this team of technicians is doing a great job of operating this building versus this team is doing a really poor job of operating the building. What I believe we find is the majority of metrics available to us today to kind of quantify that are, is this team getting a lot of complaints or is this team get, getting just a few complaints? Um, and it really doesn't create a fair way to kind of look at how we're actually uh, uh, operating within the buildings. And again, I keep going back to operation within the buildings, and we're going to touch on it again a little bit later, but 
all sustainability and all these different things, they have to be sustained activities. And you can't have sustained activities without involving the boots on the ground or the people that you need to understand these concepts to avoid making changes in things within the building that are creating problems. So there's a lot of challenges that are still the same and they're, they're across pretty much every building that we see. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of improvements that are happening due to new technology, but we still have a lot of limited or no visibility and you wind up having to do a lot of guesswork when their problems come up within a building. As a result, we handle buildings and their teams uh, almost as in they're always in firefighting mode. Uh, it's very rare that you have somebody on a facilities team or even within a building infrastructure or even within a, a contract team where they're operating based on a strategy as opposed to just operating based on what's right in front of them. Everybody at this point in time due to workforce development and all the other issues going on, lack of time, team, money needed to do and to put the fires out. Everybody can, can identify with that within the building space. And then there's almost no way to validate performance of anything, including contracting work. If you don't have access to the data, if you don't have a way to visualize the data, you have to take people's words for it. And you wind up with buildings and, and things that are operated on a lot of uh, emotion and rhetoric rather than kind of data and fact. And another part of the reason that this happens is that directors, facility managers, people that are kind of answering these questions about how their buildings are going to attain these things, they can't quantify any results. Again, I talked before about just do more, do it better, do it faster. Well, people will hear that from bosses, but then when they say, well, what should I do more and what should I do better and do faster? Nobody really knows because they're not really being graded on any type of a metric that makes sense today. And then we move in a little bit to the people that work underneath them. That's the technicians. These are the boots on the ground. And when we get into the product, I'm going to show you a little bit about why it's so important that these individuals get a better understanding. Um, one more comfort complaint call is going to send them straight into therapy. That is what drives the day-to-day -day for most buildings I've ever been in is I'm too hot, I'm too cold. They wind up spinning wheels trying to tackle a super long list of problems without any real strategy because they're just, you know, this complaint call came in, I'm running out to it. They have no idea how long it's going to take to fix and find the latest problem because every single thing is a brand new investigation without a lot of history or data. Now, granted, you can have trends uh, from your BAS and things like that, but all of that, again, involves data. And we're still just talking about why the data is so important. And then there's just another little quip that I can relate to around can't remember the last good night's sleep because you're just waiting for another emergency to show up. Uh, and that's that's very true for anybody that's in the building or construction uh, space uh, or even contractor space. It can be brutal. And then if you do sleep well as a facilities technician or even a, a general contractor in a lot of these buildings, waking up can be a bummer. You have no idea what your day is going to be. That whole trial and error thing just kind of starts all over again. So I want to talk a little bit about why data can help with all of that and how data helps with all of that. So one of the first things I like to talk a little bit about are the silos. Um, whether this is in a building infrastructure, a school organization, a city organization, I mean, anywhere, anything that's of any scale, there are silos all over the place. And even in smaller buildings or construction projects, we see a lot of silos. We know that the facility owner needs one thing, the facility director might need another, the occupant might need another, the engineer and the facility tech. And what's interesting about this is that every one of these different groups, and it can be expanded to include others, whether you're talking about a commissioning engineer or electrician or mechanical or any of that, um, but all of their goals are in silos. They don't work together. I have run into many situations where engineers have put in energy conservation measures and then you know, been up in arms when a facility technician made a manual override change to a set point that knocked out the validity of that ECM. But in the facility technician's mind, they're just doing their job of making sure that that person that was complaining on the sixth floor is comfortable. And that facility section technician almost never has a way to talk back and forth directly with that engineer or for that engineer to inform the facility technician of why they're doing certain things or why it needs to be done. And you wind up with a bunch of different people giving a bunch of different answers to a bunch of different bosses without any real strategy or organization. Um, and kind of at the bottom of the list where I, where I look at even the facility technicians in this is that they really have four or five bosses in these scenarios. Um, they have occupants that are going to complain about one thing that they're expected to take care of. They have facility owners that are going to be looking towards energy reductions and savings that they're supposed to take care of. They're going to have facility directors that are going to have PMs and things that they want to have done that they're supposed to take care of. And there's no real way today that all of them communicate in a really effective manner that allows a facility technician to get a complaint call from an occupant and say, hey, 
I understand you might be uncomfortable, but this is within our set point parameters that are, you know, ordained for the building, and, and this is what it's going to be. So the way that we can help to break down the silos is allowing people to speak a common language. Uh, and where I think a lot of that starts is that kind of centralized news database. A metaphor that I've used in the past is that if you search for the results from a news story in California, you get different results in that exact same search if you made it in Alabama. And it's due to computer algorithms that say, you know what, you're gonna be more likely to view this website again if you get this kind of a response. And you get these jaded and very uh, biased responses based on what you look at. The same thing happens within buildings. And a lot of that is because the data we're getting is based off of opinion. It's based off of rhetoric. It's, your guys are terrible. This place is always cold. You guys are burning up so much energy. This, this unit doesn't need to be replaced. Your team is just lazy. All those different types of things. And it might as well be somebody speaking Japanese to somebody speaking, you know, uh, uh, Hispanic to or Spanish to uh, any number of different languages. They just don't communicate accurately and well together. And so we can create that common language uh, most easily, I believe, through analytics and visualizations, the visualization portion of the analytics. Um, showing somebody some little lines and graphs that say, hey, when this goes up, it's supposed to go down here and it doesn't happen. That's a lot easier for uh, somebody to understand whether than going through a, a lengthy explanation about how a set point was reached and it's supposed to cause this, that, and the other. Another component of it is that centralized information hub. Um, we, we believe that everybody that has a vested interest in the building should have access to the data, um, not just the building professionals necessarily, not just necessarily the contractors, the MSIs are a limited few. Um, but I think that once you expose the building data to a larger number of people, you get a larger, you get a larger overall understanding. And that'll kind of lead into the third piece where data and facts will help dif uh, determine operational improvements. And when you're showing black and white numbers to somebody, uh, especially if they're a numbers person, uh, like potentially a, a financial higher up or something like that, it tends to make a lot more sense than the word cabbage that comes out. Um, we also have some additional values that we can bring with data. A lot of things around visibility to help remove some of the guesswork. Uh, we really want to use it to start proactively fix things and, and stop things before they become big problems and complaints and really create syst uh, uh, strategic approaches to the way that we operate the buildings rather than just these uh, reactive, hey, there's a fire, let's go put it out. Um, another reason that it's important today is that workforce development is, 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 is really struggling. It's really difficult to people, get people into these fields. And so we have to use technology to allow one person to do a lot more with fewer resources. Uh, and then again, just around the strategic component. And then it's gonna let you monitor, monitor and verify work being done to ensure that everyone is on the same page. Uh, products like these can allow people to stop saying, okay, I wonder if my contractor is really fixing anything, or I wonder if my, if my technicians or teams are really doing anything, or I wonder if that uh, recommendation that engineer made had any impact. You don't have to wonder anymore. You can you can monitor it, you can verify it. And you can do that because it's going to be a source of truth. It's just going to be the data. But data can't do it alone. Uh, the data is what provides analytics the power that it needs to actually give us outputs. But the data by itself is just a mess of numbers and jumbled information. Analytics is where we're going to process it. Uh, that's kind of a broad version. And then FDD is just a little bit more of a defined uh, version, which you guys are, I'm sure, all familiar with. But it's your basic fault detection diagnostics. Um, the reason why these presentations are so beneficial, there's a number of reasons, but one of the reasons why I believe that these uh, presentations are so beneficial today is that modern buildings, they're built for this stuff. Um, and every OEM or manufacturer on the planet, all, anything new they have, it's all geared around, hey, it creates this data. It gives you this data. Um, again, the sensors that I mentioned in the emails earlier, it's all about getting that data. And so with all that happening, the modern building, there's so much data available. Anything that's been built probably within the last five or 10 years is gonna have tons of different data metrics and points available that many people have probably thought to themselves, why would I ever need to use this or ever I need to understand it? Uh, and then when we combine the data with analytics, some of the outputs we can get are things like centralized operational visibility. So a way to review everything that's happening from a location. We can get into reduced energy use and costs, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I don't like the energy uh, reduction to be the focus of this, because I think it's really just a result of the true focus, which is creating better operational standards and habits in a building. <clears throat> There's some others there, but I won't spend too much time on it uh, around optimized comfort, informed capital investments, things like that. But 
we're going to move on and jump into a demo. So I'm going to stop the screen share for just a moment. There we go. And I'll start the screenshot again. All right. So what you guys uh, are able to see here is this is a version of, of uh, not a version, but this is one of our dashboards. I say one of because I'll be going over a number of different things. Um, but I like to demonstrate the simplest components of our product. Um, there are additional feature pages on the left hand side that I do not have enabled for this demonstration. So I'll jump over to another uh, live customer at some point here while I go through the demo to show you what those additional features are. But I wanted to present to you guys the same way that we present this product out to kind of anybody we discuss it with around our methodology and our plans for, for how it's most useful. And where that always starts for us is going to be within reports. Now, I spoke a little bit about how we believe that uh, uh, KPIs and a way to kind of track the way that things are going is going to be important to how uh, buildings can be operated in the future and that we have to create these tools to help the people actually operating within a building. And in order to do that, we want to start by finding ways that we can save them time initially. So one of the ways that we can help them save time is through reports where we can take large sets of equipment and data and metrics, bundle it all up into something meaningful and then have some reason why we can use it and what it's supposed to be tracking and what it's supposed to accomplish. And so each report should more or less be looked at as a KPI or a performance goal. The KPI or the performance number is referenced by what we have over here known as the ROS, that's our Resolute Optimization Score. Um, and the Resolute Optimization Score is gonna look at each individual piece of equipment on a report. It's gonna give each piece of equipment its own score and then it's going to average those scores up to come up with an overall score. And we'll see more about that as I jump into it. I'm actually going to zoom in a little bit just because it might be tough for people to see. Now, the report that I often talk about people starting with, and it's a good example because it shows a number of pieces of equipment, and it's the way that I present it into buildings is, hey, we want to start developing these better habits on the way that you operate because overall it's just going to help you save time, money, and energy. And we always, I always recommend that people start off as their first visit with the air terminal unit operations. And when this report is available, the reason I have people start off with it is because it addresses what I talked about earlier as being, uh, at least in the past, the primary concern. And really today, it's still the primary concern. And that's in comfort. And what this report is looking at is, is out of all your zones, how many of them are able to perform to your comfort standards? Basically, are they performing the set point? And so what that accurately provides for a building is more or less a comfort KPI. Uh, this tells you how comfortable your zones are. And where we get this number from is the report that we'll jump into, but we have 123 total pieces of equipment in here or terminal units. Four of them are being noted as performing poorly for this week up here, the 20th through the 26th. So it is a recent report. 15 of these were noted as being okay. So they're slipping a little bit, but still performing well enough. And the vast majority of them, 92, are, are reporting well and doing fine. And so right off the bat, this kind of helps us uh, manage buildings a little bit by just saying, OK, if I've got 123 zones, where do I start my week? Where do I look for issues? Where do I look for problems when I have this many? Well, let's start off at the four. But beyond that, moving over to the right a little bit, there's a few different ways that we can view reports. We can either download them as a PDF. There's also a report history, which I think is really beneficial uh, uh, as, as time kind of moves on. You can see we've had this report running for a short time here, and you can see what those scores do over time with that. But more importantly, the report goes into our next step. So I want everybody to think about the reporting as a portion of this workflow or methodology. The reports are where you find a KPI or you find something that you're interested in achieving, whether it's indoor air quality, uh, improved PID tuning, improved operations of your air handlers, uh, things like that. And typically, we recommend that it get based on whatever score is the lowest, it has the most degradation. Once you verify what activity you want to take on, now we want to use the report to find out where you can put the most impact onto that activity. And so this particular report is our air terminal unit operations report. It's showing from the 20th uh, to the 26th of February. So is that last week? These reports are automatically generated every week and there's also a monthly report. And just like the other screen, we see 123 total pieces, four bad, 15 okay, 92 good. We have a small key here that explains what the different columns below are referring to, but I'll just do that manually. And so on number four here, we can see that this device is located on floor one. 
It's equipment piece ATU-116, and it is supplied by parent air handler AHU-0105. And I'd just like to point out the parent portion because it does talk a little bit about the smarts, uh, quote unquote, into the report, where there are certain things like if the parent air handling unit's fan is not on for a device uh, being supplied by the air handler, we don't score for it. An additional thing that I'll just scroll down to the bottom briefly for is that if we find a parent unit that appears to be off, we take its children out of the report, we drop them to the bottom, and we negate the score along with the notification of, hey, this parent unit might be overridden or off. Uh, and we do that so that way people are not penalized negatively for having equipment off that might be intended. And again, we, that's important to us because we want this score to be looked at as something that a customer can use as feedback to their contractors, or more importantly, that a facility team can help to use to kind of validate what they're doing. So when I look across here, again, I mentioned the name, we have a score, this one's given a 49. The reason it has that score is because 80% of the time, it's colder than the set point is requesting. It's never too hot. The airflow is right around the set point, so it's doing really well. And your reheat valve is open almost all the time, above 95, above 5% open. Now, I don't know how much everybody here understands about these concepts, but I'm gonna kind of roll into them a little bit anyways. What we also provide with that is something called a root cause. And this root cause is a combination of the metrics and the analytic faults that are going into this report to provide an output that we believe will help lead towards a resolution. Um, and so we're saying that, hey, if it's always cold, your airflow is right on point, your reheat's always on, there's another thing that we're gonna see on the report that pulls it in, but it's telling us that high DAT could be causing air stratification or high discharge air temperature could be causing air stratification. If we wanna validate this, which is what I always recommend, we click on the equipment name and it's gonna bring us immediately into our charting tool uh, with all the metrics and rules that were attached to this, uh, to this report uh, being uh, shown here so we can kind of validate what the report is telling us. And I won't spend too much time on it, even though I do like to nerd out on these things because it's fun, um, but uh, we were given a high DAT causing air stratification. Now. One of the things that I think is pretty interesting about this is that uh, that's not a concept that a lot of facilities teams are going to know. And one of the things I actually appreciate about that is, one, at a glance, if I'm a manager of these teams or if I'm a contractor about to go and approach this building for a repair, I can tell them, hey, there's a good chance your facilities team won't be able to do anything about these few issues. Uh, the others they might be able to go take a look at, but this one will be tough. So now, how do we start rectifying this, especially if we if we know as as uh, who can actually take care of this? Um, and actually, I, I moving ahead a little bit quickly, I want to go back because one of the things that I always find interesting about the high discharge air temperature is it's counterintuitive. We're seeing here that 106 degree air is not heating up a space that's at 60 degrees. Uh, and it seems like the hotter, the better. And one of the things that I like being able to display with this is that the green line up here is the discharge air temperature. And when you see the discharge air temperature drop down, you actually see an increase in the zone temperature. And there's an additional component here that's kind of interesting around the airflow also increasing, which can help cause the discharge air temperature to decrease. And then it starts to help remove that stratification. But I only learned all that stuff because I looked it up. Um, general people are not gonna know that and we still want them to be able to do something with this output. So at any point in our product, anybody can copy a URL and then paste it anywhere. You can paste it in a text message, in an email, whoever you want to, you want to paste it to and they can read it as long as they are a user of our product um, uh, and when they click that link. But more importantly, we wanted to create kind of a light version of a CMMS system. We wanted to create a action and tracking system uh, for the building activities. And so if I wanted to have something done with that, I would actually go into my action center, select the building that I wanted to look at, and then I would create a new action and I'll zoom back out to normal zoom. And I've already got some things created, so I won't go through typing these up. I'll actually just jump into one that we already looked at for this. Uh, and we're actually using this to help uh, educate some students around data interpretation and different problems that you might see within buildings. So we have here an, an action item around zone temp is less than set point. And if I view the action, 
Uh, I have a nice explanation in here. All of this stuff can be edited and filled out by whoever's creating the action. Uh, this one is more geared towards students and education, but there's other things around cost and effort that you can put into an action item to validate things that you might need to. But one of the things that I put on there was a, uh, as a link in the action item is a stratification explanation. So anybody that went to go look at this action item, if they needed a hint around what stratification is or does, they can put that in there. Um, there was, there's a component in here around the things that you should do, what you can do uh, to reduce uh, stratification. Um, but more importantly, we have the links back into the product. Now, in this example, the way that we were using it with the students is we found all of the areas that had a rule in fault, and this will pull us into the, to the analytics component to show a little bit of that. And we looked at all of the zone temperature to low uh, faults that were in place. We put that as a link in the product and you can see up at the top here, the students and I, we were looking at this on the 16th to the 20th. And we have some filters in place within our analytics component that are specifically looking for VAB. And we're specifically looking for the zone temperature is less than set point rule being in violation. And the reason that we did this is because we were asking, are there any common uh, faults in addition to the zone temperature is less than set point that you're seeing that could explain these comfort issues. And what they saw is the discharge air temp is, uh, exceeds high limit threshold, has also been in violation on any of the zones that are not able to maintain and meet set point. And so what does the discharge air temperature exceeds high limit threshold mean? Well, we have rule details for that. The rule details are really intended to start helping individuals get a better understanding of some building operation and some engineering concepts. This particular one comes directly from ASHRAE, and it basically tells you that your discharge air temperature should be no more than 15 degrees above the heating set uh, temperature set point. And we're able to view this, this chart by clicking that same kind of button that takes us back into our charting tool. And we can see when this rule is in violation, and we can just see that, yep, in fact, we're, we're just over top, but it's not too, too bad. And so we can go back and forth and we can look at all those different faults and violations. Um, but kind of going back to it and circling back a little bit, the way I want, the way I like our product to be viewed and the way that I, that, that it's going to be the most impactful is with a purpose. And again, the purpose that we look at for it is use your reports to determine an arena that you really want to deal with. Once you find that arena, validate uh, what the report's telling you by clicking the links and viewing the act items actually within Explorer. Once you validate the things you've seen with, within Explorer, take them to the Action Center and put them into a, uh, uh, a component where you can then uh, link it to an action item, give some light instructions, what you're hoping to have done, and actually see that thing getting taken care of and addressed. Um, so again, there's a lot of stuff that we can do with data, and I know the explanation that I'm giving you now is really simplified, and I'm not going to complicate it that much more. The reason I'm keeping it that simple is because what I have found through conversations and dealing with a lot of individuals is that engineers, uh, master systems integrators, kind of high-level building individuals, they don't need a lot of these tools to really help them understand buildings. Um, they, you could give them just simple access to Explorer where they would have the ability to create whatever charts they would want to create and, and add a bunch of zone temperatures and look at meters and all those things. And they could probably make it sing and do whatever it is they could possibly want it to do. But it's the teams operating in the buildings, it's the newer people that when they see something like this, which is just a bunch of data metrics coming from a, a single air handler, it just means Japanese. And so that's why, again, the whole the whole component of this uh, for Resolute is that we want to get the, this understanding and this learning into the hands of the people uh, that are actually operating within these buildings and then give the tools of the oversight to the people that already know this stuff. Um, so kind of moving along uh, with that example, um, I want to touch on the analytics piece one more time because I keep mentioning about how this is primarily something that we gear towards the facilities teams and the technicians and things along that line. Uh, analytics is a little bit different. The analytics component is where we're gonna see stuff that is gonna be more geared towards people with a little bit of a higher level understanding, because this is where you're gonna see things like majority of VAVs are in a heating mode. And that's not something that a technician or somebody that's operating within a building is gonna be able to address or deal with but they can still learn a little bit about it from the rule details. And ideally, 
This is where uh, engineers or master systems integrators or controls contractors like that would spend some time to really go one at a time optimizing your individual pieces of equipment. And the reason I say it like that is because I have the filter over to looking at last week and we're looking at an air handling unit and we're looking at all the rules attached to an air handling unit. In this particular uh, air handler, we have 28 rules. And this is where we do have the things around free cooling is not maximized. Um, uh, fan status is off when it appears to be operating. Discharge air stab, you know, all those kinds of different things, uh, including this mixed air damper is unable to meet discharge air temperature set point. So these are things that typically your facility teams aren't going to be able to do. But these are things that are important if you want to have a high performance building. If we look at this particular rule, discharge air static pressure set point can be decreased. Again, we pull up the rule detail because we want to make sure the building owners and the teams know this isn't just me saying that it's something that you should do. But this is something that ASHRAE 90.1 wants to see to make sure that your building is a high performance building. Uh, if you provide that, if you want to have a high performance building, this is what it requires to do that. Um, and just like with the reports and with the other things I've shown, if you click that Explorer icon, it's going to take us right back into the charts that are, again, trying to validate that rule. And I always like this rule because I think it shows, again, kind of the power at looking at things from a high level. And that's the whole component around, we have one device here, right here, this ATU323 is the only one that's got its stamp rail at 100%. And I don't know if many people on this, uh, on this uh, tutorial uh, or this demo understand discharge air static pressure reset. But what I think is neat about it is basically if that's not an important zone and you eliminate that from the logic, that air handler fan speed is going to slow down and you'll be able to open up these dampers more and save some energy, save some lifetime on the equipment. Now, one more thing that I like to use uh, as an example from this uh, set of reports, which do come from a real building, by the way, uh, even though we have it all anonymized, this is a, a real building and it's only about three years old. We can see here that our comfort is doing pretty well with our air terminal unit operations report. But we have a controller performance report that attaches to those units as well, and it's showing not doing quite as well. This one's in the yellow. And the reason that it's cautioning us and why I think this is important is because if people are not comfortable, that's typically when I hear the most complaints or the most problems get solved. If people aren't complaining and they're comfortable, then it tends to allow building problems to just linger and continue on and on and on until somebody actually notices it or brings it up. So we have this controller performance report. And what the controller performance report is geared towards is looking at your loops. How well tuned is everything within your, within your portfolio? And what we can see with some of these poor scoring ones, and we have a number of them, almost all of them have a poor score not relating to their damper, but it relates to their reheat. And what this particular report is telling us is how many times the actuators attached to these different uh, functions tried to move over the course of this time frame. So just a week. And it makes a lot of sense as to why we're showing poor scores for this, because we've been seeing that the damper was told to move 107 times, once an hour, it gets a score of 99, which is a great score. The reheat, however, that actuator was told to move 16,188 times last week. Every hour it was told to move 97 times. And when I click the link to look at this device, we're probably gonna see an EKG reading. And there it is. And so, what this is trying to tell us is that this thing is over exercising this actuator and that you should do a little bit of improvement on your PID tuning for that. And the fact that we see that over so many of these devices means that this is likely uh, uh, potentially a systemic issue. But where it allows you to get a little bit further with things is that you can actually start drilling down even a little bit more. Because if all of these devices are having all of this issue with the, uh, um, uh, with, the, uh, with the hot water, maybe it's not actually the, uh, the independent tuning at all. Maybe it's more likely coming actually from the boiler. And I'm not going to pull it all in there now, um, but you are able to pull things in like the firing rate. And what we'll be able to see is that it's actually the boiler that seems to be having the issue. So any terminal unit that would be attached to this uh, would be having the same problem. And that helps to explain why a controller performance report is looking like this. And as I said, uh, or as we said in the, demo, the presentation component, uh, data can't do it alone. It still needs people. Um, there are gonna be constant improvements within softwares that are gonna mean that you know, these types of outputs will come directly to you. 
But there's still a component where an individual has to look at these things and make some determinations and some understandings in order to get them corrected. Um, jump around. I'm actually going to stop my screen share for one moment because I want to hop into another customer site uh, where I'm going to show you guys a quick example of some of the other functionality that we have in the product. Um, I mentioned that I didn't like to put a lot of focus on the energy component of it, um, but that doesn't mean that we don't have all the things that would be needed to track that energy. Uh, and so I'm going to pull up a customer once I navigate through all my, my company sensitive stuff. Here we go. And I'll reshare. Right. And so this is an example of a customer portfolio where they're doing more extensive metering and things like that. And you can see that there's a lot more of these icons open over here. Something I should mention, because uh, I haven't, is there's no additional cost in our product whatsoever to have these additional features opened up. It is simply just whether or not you want to monitor those things and if you have any data that attributes to it. That includes things like an overview page, the energy usage page. There's a custom dashboards page where individuals can make their own dashboards if they want to. Uh, reports and document center you guys have already seen. Document center I didn't talk about, but it's pretty neat. You can upload documents into it so they live with the building. Again, trying to create that platform where everything that happens within the building can be tracked and monitored and understood within, within this platform. Um, the user management, however, I did not touch on. Uh, something that we really believe in at Resolute is that the data, again, is important for everybody. So user management for our product is completely unlimited. You can have as many users as you want. Um, we encourage entire infrastructures to put people uh, as users within the product. Um, there's entire classes uh, within school districts that have users uh, within our product so they can review different things and they have that isolated down to, to help them understand that the, the, what's going on within the buildings that they actually are, are trying to learn within, uh, which I really like. Um, and I also didn't touch on it. I'll click on this one because it'll open up a new link. We have a fully fledged help center. The help center is uh, uh, has every topic addressed, a great search functionality, um, and is is built out along with some additional rule or uh, articles and things like that. Um, but again, I'm not going to spend too much time looking into the uh, the energy components. I just wanted to quickly kind of uh, show some of this stuff, and I'll go back to February so you guys can see the baselines. Um, we will also track things around energy usage index. We can uh, create savings percentages, all kinds of different things like that. But again, where I kind of step back from that a little bit is I don't believe that that's where I, well, not even just I, we at Resolute don't believe that that's really the key for actually attaining these sustainability goals uh, that we're all talking about uh, having within uh, our portfolios. And so I'm gonna go back to the presentation piece for just a moment. Because I want to get through to, there's some must-have FDD capabilities. I'm going to run through this portion pretty quickly and get passed on to the key value considerations. How long before I'm up and running? Seeing all those things like the reports and all that stuff, that's a really important question. Uh, we're going to show a quick timeline of, of what we believe that looks like for Resolute. Um, and because it's really important. Time to value is critical. What is the real cost of the solution? Not just what's your SaaS fee, not just this or that, but the total cost. What's my implementation time? How many hours am I gonna have to put into this? Am I gonna have to buy equipment? You know, all those things. Is it scalable? Are you asking about this for an organization or an infrastructure that's large? And if something works on a one-off, is it gonna work on 1,000? Um, also access, something that I touched on that we think is important, there should be unlimited access. Nobody should make you buy licenses to let people view the data in my, in my opinion. Um, and so I think that that's an important component. So there's a couple of tips that I wanna run through really briefly uh, in, in the next probably five to six minutes before we jump into the questions. Um, but don't force it. These are, these, are, these are, I'd say Steve's keys to success or sort of just nine keys to success, but. These are things that I've learned coming from a commercial background experience into an integration experience, into customer support experience, and bring all those different things around how FDD is applied and utilized. This is the stuff that, that these are some of the, the key points I, I think are important. One, don't force it. If you're not ready for it, if your building's not ready for it, if there's nobody that actually wants to utilize it, then it's not, it's almost pointless. There's nothing worse than, in, in, in my experience, uh, than applying our product on a place where there's no real goal. Um, if you don't have a goal in mind or something that you're actually trying to accomplish, then it, it winds up being in a position where you force people to use it and nobody likes that.
Two, know what you want. It's really important that you understand what it is you're trying to get out of a product. Are you after reducing carbon and energy and electricity purely? Are you after improving uh, uh, different, just a number of different things. You really have to know what you want because there's a lot of different products and they're all gonna have different things. Know thyself, honestly assess your capabilities and deficiencies. Uh, make sure you do this upfront because you want to select the right vendor and you want to make sure that you're going to get the atten intended outcomes in the amount of time that you're expecting. Right size your expectations. There is no solution that's perfect for everything. And there's nothing that can be simply plugged in and is going to solve all your problems. I know there's some product lines out there that are making some claims, but I promise you there is nothing out there yet where you apply it, you walk away from it and you're saving money, operating better and your building's more comfortable. It just doesn't happen. It is a combination of data, people, and most importantly, process. Five, I love this one because I talk about it a lot, make it a habit. Um, habitual changes are the way to see sustainable improvements. It's not through diets. I always make a comment around, uh, uh, you know, that time where you're gonna lose weight and you're gonna start going to the gym, you're gonna go seven days a week, you're gonna run five miles a day, you're gonna stop drinking soda, you're gonna stop eating carbs, you're gonna only eat paleo, you're gonna only eat kale, all that stuff. Those are diets. That's the same thing we do in buildings. We do ECMs or energy conservation measures and they don't become a sustainable habit within the building. They become a hindrance to people that are trying to operate when they get turned off because somebody changes the set point. And a lot of that's because we don't create habits around these improved uh, uh, operating strategies. Celebrate the wins. Like, please, when, when you get wins through this type of, of stuff, you got to celebrate them. Uh, endorphins keep people wanting to come back for more. Um, and that's not just for, uh, uh, you know, like Resolute saying, hey, you guys, oh, it was a great product. Thank you. It's more for the teams of when you accomplish something, make sure people are aware of the success. Always be strategic. If you've decided to go down this route, you're going to be trying to transition organizations into a more strategic organization. Whether you're operating as an engineer for a, a large company to implement sustainability practices, maybe you're a controls vendor or operator that's been tasked by the building owner to do any of these things, um, you want to be strategic. Uh, the same thing come, boils down to this if you're a commissioning firm where uh, you start creating strategies around consistent data overlays and consistent ways that you can view this stuff to have one-to-one -one, uh, 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 visualization. And then execution trumps all. Um, looking at stuff is great, but unless you put together a plan and a way to actually do things, um, it, it's, it's useless. Uh, and what I mean by that are things like, you know, at a lot of buildings, we're finding that airflow set points being shifted by technicians that are not aware is causing a lot of problems. So in order to rectify that, you can't just inform anybody. Uh, they worked with the controls vendor to create a lockout for that so the technicians can no longer do it. And then communicate consistently, even the bad stuff. I think we're finally exiting the era where everybody in a building was afraid to ask for money um, because that was a thing for a long time where you were a failure of somebody working in a building, whether you were a contractor, engineer, or technician, if you requested money to get something replaced. Um, Nobody wanted to talk about problems, and I think a lot of that was because people had a hard time explaining the problems in ways that building owners or others could understand. Um, but when you have the data right in front of things, uh, you can really show that you can that you can be credible. And I like this line: "Data brings trust, but honesty uh, and uh, uh, breeds credibility." That if you're upfront and honest uh, with the data, you're going to get credibility as a result. So those are just some nine key takeaways. And then I, I'm just gonna talk really briefly because I got about two more minutes before we're gonna jump into the questions. Uh, Resolute, we are a company that was started by a software, uh, as a, as by a software team where we quickly, it was, it was quickly determined that we need to combine software design engineers with actual building engineers. So for the last five years, we've had a combination of uh, PEs, uh, CEMs, people like myself doing uh, property management all using our product with the intent of building it into something that we would have used in our past professional careers. Um, and so there's just a couple slides I'm gonna fly through briefly on that. Time to value is the real thing that sets us apart from everybody else. Um, everything that you guys saw in the first example, uh, that can all be accomplished in either one to two days or one to two hours, uh, and typically anywhere from $1,500 to $5,000 uh, per building uh, can get you all those results. Um, we do that through a U.S. patent we have around our uh, configuration, um, which, uh, which we got awarded last year. 
uh, where we do a lot of bulk configuration and very, very quickly. So what I'm pulling up next is a recent case study, and I, I can't give the customer name, um, but this was a customer handoff that I did two weeks ago. And meeting one happened on day one where we reviewed the product and the workflow of the product with the customer. Our second meeting, which happened two days later, was with the IT group to get permissions. Day one of implementation, which happened about four days after the IT uh, meeting, we had six hours of integration, including a JACE. Now our product, we hold our hat on software connectors where we can connect instantly without any hardware devices to um, uh, either any Niagara platform, any uh, Siemens, uh, Zego CC or Optics, any FIN platform, uh, and as well as KMC Commander platform. If you don't have one of those platforms, we have to add in an additional layer. And in this case, the customer added in a JACE so we could go to the Niagara platform. Now this caused them to take six hours to install the JACE. The following day, they had to finish up that installation with a couple of hours in Niagara. And then we did the configuration within our software within two hours. So for days three through six, we just collected the data and waited for the report generation. Reports take about a week to generate. We always go from Sunday to, to Saturday. And so that customer handoff meeting was on day seven where we did the handoff to the customer with, uh, with our end or to the end user with our customer in tow where they explained the product and what it was and how they could utilize it and how they could use it to track things. Um, and it was, a, it was a great handoff, it was successful. The customer was really happy. Um, so I just like to put that out there because this is a timeline that we're really proud of. And even with this being the timeline, uh, there's actually a day in here that we're gonna eliminate. And I'll talk a little bit more about that potentially during the Q and A. Um, but for now, I have a number of other slides that we're not even gonna bother with. Oh, and it looks like I got through it to the Q&A part anyway. So I will, uh, I will stop the share. Let me get back over to this. You can leave that up, Stephen. Um, you might wanna Thank go you. back to the dashboard based on one of the questions. So are you ready for the first question? Absolutely. Okay. Um, what commissioning tools do you have? Can they be automated? Asks Kyle. Okay. So I'll actually jump in uh, to show a little bit about this. So commissioning tools, it's, it's, it's kind of a loaded question is the way I look at that. Um, the reason I say that is because there's a number of different ways that you could try and commission. Um, you can either set up custom rules uh, or custom points within our product that will allow you to look for certain kind of uh, specific things that you're wondering about. You can also do things around creating specific bookmarks within our product. And I might actually have some created here now that I can show you. Um, let's grab one of these. Yep. So if there was something that you were trying to track around a specific opportunity within the building or a specific commissioning thing around that, um, you, could, you could bookmark different uh, uh, equipment pieces or charts that kind of accommodate that. Um, and then there's also the different analytic faults that you could make sure are in place for the different equipment pieces that you're monitoring. Um, our analytic rules and faults are applied based on what points and what your equipment type is. And so based on that, we're gonna give you kind of a, a laundry list of rules that you could apply. And you may wanna apply all of them. You may wanna apply only a couple of them to ensure that you're able to, to, to just view the things that you're commissioning. Um, but even where I kind of where I kind of always go back to uh, uh, immediately for commissioning is is the Explorer tool. Um, just that ability to sit there and, and go in and say, okay, you know, what's my zone temp everywhere? Do I have any outliers that are that are creating any major issues or anything like that? Um, and you can grab the stuff pretty quickly, which I think is also pretty neat. Um, so I hate answering it that way. The whole there's more than one way to kind of skin a cat type of methodology. Um, but there really is. So it, it almost depends specifically on what that commissioning activity is. Um, with the real answer just being when you're utilizing data, there's really, as long as you have the data and the information, there's so many ways that it can be visualized uh, that, that you can find a way to address the activity you're looking for. Related to that, and it's actually not Kyle's question. It's just a question that's been asked through um, these demonstrations, Stephen, is mm -hmm. you have the ability to send a command out of your platform to the control system. I know data goes into your platform, but can you send a command out and override controls? We drew a hard line on that as a no. We believe the BAS is what the BAS is. Your, your control system is meant to do the controlling. 
Um, analytics is meant to analyze and review that stuff. And there's a component of it where it's, yeah, it'd be nice to be able to send commands directly from here. But we only want, we want people to have this as view only because we don't want there to be any hesitancy for anybody to have access to this product. We don't want there to be hesitancy to say, oh, you might make these changes, you might do this or that. And we don't believe that uh, any technology is really at a point yet where automatic command and control, like a, a command coming from a software output, is we don't believe the technology is there yet to accurately do that. Um, and so right now we're a hard line saying, no, we are not, there is no way to send any commands from our product into the automation system. Future build out, we actually are investigating uh, machine learning for scheduling and potentially optimized start stop. Uh, but that's but that's down the road. And even then, uh, we still would potentially just require that that activity be taken in the BAS. Um, again, because we just feel like the BAS is there for a reason and, and analytics is there for a separate reason. Okay, very clear. Um, just for the sake of the attendees, uh, please submit your questions for Stephen. Um, we're gonna go over um, if you happen to submit a question and you don't have time to stay on and hear the answer, you can always have access to the recording of this session, which will be posted on our on-demand platform. But um, please submit your questions in the question interface. So the next question comes from Dan. Uh, does Resolute use an external software platform like SkySpark on their platform? No, we actually, I, uh, we're really proud of it. We, we built our platform uh, from scratch. Um, we've built our platform over the last four years. Um, it is hosted on Amazon Web Services. Uh, one of the ways that I, I kind of do like to show just the, the power of it, and, and I don't know if anybody really notices this outside of myself, but um, even pulling up, I think we pulled up 100 zone temperatures, uh, and I don't know if anybody noticed how quickly that kind of populates. We built it on our own, and we are very uh, uh, sensitive to uh, things like uh, load times. Um, I don't know, just I'm trying to think of a better way to answer it other than just uh, uh, we built it on our own and we believe it's the best, but that, that's kind of where we're at with it. <laughs> okay. So Sweta asks, are all your rules based on ASH rate guidelines? No, we have a number of rules that are based on just kind of general engineering best practices. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't believe there's like one of them would be uh, uh, simultaneous heating and cooling. I mean, I'm sure that there's components around ASHRAE that address that, but we have that as like a specific fault individually. Um, I'm just pulling it up and extending the time frame out. Uh, every rule that does pull from ASHRAE within the rule details, it will show the exact uh, the exact reference for ASHRAE uh, that that it's it's dealing with. Um, so if I pull up this AHU, I can just see, I'm sure there will be, yeah, so like majority of VAVs in heating mode does not have an ASHRAE standard attached, um, but we just believe that it's an engineer, or it's a best practice for a building where if all your VAVs are heating, let's uh, raise up that discharge air temp and stop reheating. Um, so yeah, that was a lengthy way of answering, but I hope that answers your question. So folks, please submit your questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask some questions that um, have been some standard questions, and maybe Stephen, you talked about these things, so you could provide short answers if you touched on them. But um, the communication protocols that are compatible with your platform, BACnet, Modbus, it's, did you address that? Well, it's anything that comes into a BAS, um, and what I mean by that is I'll actually jump in to uh, how we actually connect to these buildings. So the way that we connect into the buildings is we create a new connector. We select one of the four uh, 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 protocols or uh, uh, BAS types that we currently integrate into. And Haystack covers anything that has a Niagara platform, which that includes things like uh, different JCI ones. Um, there's a, a Schneider uses a, a Niagara platform. KMC uses a Niagara platform separate from the commander. Um, so that actually hits a lot of the, the BASs for us. Um, and really, it's just anything that you can get into the automation system, you can get into our product. Um, now, there's other ways that are more tedious to enter individual building uh, or, or data or things that you might want to see, um, which I'll just show real briefly here, in the ability to add manual entry points. So if you have things like billing data or stuff like that that you're not getting into the BAS, you can create manual entry points. Um, 
if you want to. And that doesn't have to be things around energy. It could be things around temperature or any of those types of things. But we do have some of that flexibility in there. I just don't like to show it during the demonstration because the demonstration component, I like to like people to see what we believe you can accomplish in a short period of time, where if you had an hour or two to do this integration, these are the results that you would get. And you just addressed a, a couple other questions. We saw the haystack, that, which is a, a question that people often ask with these demonstrations. Another is, um, are, um, is any physical hardware required on site for your platform? So the short answer is no, um, but the longer answer is sometimes. So as I mentioned with the connectors, if you don't have one of the uh, one of the uh, okay, click that too fast, if you don't have one of these types of automation systems, and you still want to utilize our product, it would require typical. Well, it's not hardware necessarily because we we have used virtual machines as well, but I, I want to look at that as hardware. Um, you either would need to add in a supervisor that had Fin Framework, Niagara, or Dezigo CC, or a Jace to kind of pull that stuff in as BACnet, Lawnworks, Modbus, whatever you'd want to do that way. And then we connect directly into the BAS and pull everything directly from there. Uh, so whatever is in the automation system will automatically funnel into our product. It, it shows up in what we call our point mapper as a file path to the point name. This might be familiar for some of you guys that, that might have worked within a BAS. Um, so we get them in as file paths, and then we take the data from there and, and do some normalization stuff. Now, uh, you touched on the N Haystack, and so I want to talk about that briefly. We utilize N Haystack, but it's only for our own internal definitions and methodology. Um, we're big believers in N Haystack. We think and that, that the Haystack dictionary is awesome and we think that it should be utilized everywhere. But then we also know that that's not the case. And since we're having, we want to provide access for anybody that's doing the BAS to, to look at our, to use our product as well. We made the decision to say, okay, we're going to normalize internally uh, using things like the N Haystack or the Haystack naming conventions. So we take different uh, uh, Haystack uh, tags and group them together to create what we call a point template. And then we apply that in our software database or our, our, so that our software understands, okay, this is the end Haystack terminology or, or, or uh, tag group that we know, understand within our product. The display name for the user stays the same. And none of the stuff within, no tagging is required within the BAS or the automation system to do any of this stuff. Um, I, I think that's where a big component of the end haystack and the verbiage comes in is that people then wonder, all right, do I have to do all this tagging to make this work? And the answer for that is no, we don't require any tags to be within the BAS. All normalization can be done within our product. Okay. Another question, uh, do you see a main use case we're using live data in this system versus using historic data like last week or last month? So it's funny that it's a great question because I always tell people there's almost no value in just looking at a day or looking at today, depending on what the activity is. The reason I say that as well is that um, if you're going to be doing that, just go into the BAS. I mean, that's what the BAS is for. The BAS is for real time. What are we doing right now? What are we going to correct? Um, analytics is more for we got data, this is what you should be doing based on what we've seen in the past or historically. Uh, so offhand, I can't think of a use case where I would say to myself, you know, you'd be better off looking at it live in our product rather than looking at it live within the BAS if you're trying to get an, an, uh, an output about something happening right then, right there in the building. So related to that, how much archival data do you, um, do you archive? It's a, another great question. I love it. I like that. Uh, so we will, because we, we have a lot of servers on MLS on web service. Um, so we will trend if you have five and I can't go into any of these customers to show you, but we have customers that have six years of historical data and we have all six years of that data trended and it will stay there. Um, they will continue to keep it. Another nice component of our product is once it comes into the, once a data point comes into our product in the unmapped, even before you do anything with it, normalize it, pay for it, even before you would be billed for anything. Um, we start trending this metric as soon as it sits here. Uh, so it means more as you go through the configuration process and we talk about setup and how you can pick and choose if you don't want to use points and things like that. Um, but I think it's really beneficial to know that, hey, as soon as we're connected into a building, 
every data point that goes into your BAS is now being trended until the end of time, um, is what they say uh, in tech speak, apparently. Okay. So um, we have some more questions. Um, do you have capability to add points you need for analytics in your software if that point is not monitored in the BAS? So the way that you'd have to do that is, I mean, yes, you can. It would be through adding custom points. Um, so there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can either do a manual entry of a point where you're just entering it for a timestamp. You can also do calculated where you're taking variables from other components of the automation system. So like right here, I get access to all the points within this building. Um, actually, I think I get for both buildings. And if I wanted to use a combination of set points or zone temperatures or something like that to try and figure out what something was, I can just select them all and add them all as variables. And then I can use different logic uh, and logical expressions. So more of an engineering activity that I don't know much about. Um, but you can create those custom points to then give you outputs that will be viewable within Fusion or the output side. Um, you could build charts with it. You could, you know, use use it as a uh, as a supplemental point for the analytics. Um, I also think it's a it's a good spot to show uh, one of the things they, that was brought up around, you know, hey, if I don't have a point that's needed for a rule or something like that, one thing that I think is pretty cool that we put together is we have a prospects page. Our rules are automatically applied, but if you're wondering what you need to have a rule that's not live for your equipment, all of these are rules that could be enabled for this AHU 0001. And if you don't know why, oh wait, no, I just clicked a uh, button. But let's say you didn't understand why a low discharge air temperature is not an, uh, an option for you on now this VAV because I flipped my pagination. You click view and it's gonna tell you exactly what points it wants to see attached to that equipment to make that rule work. Um, so I, I just think it's good to point that out that uh, uh, we also, in addition to, hey, what do you do if you need those points? Well, we provide you a way to determine what points you would need to get specific outputs. Um, it was very important to us that there's a lot of, is the juice worth the squeeze mentality where people don't have to guess as to what their results are of any configuration activity they put in, but it's more of a, hey, if I sit down and put in this time, these are the results I can get. Okay. Next question, um, how do you show value um, Value uh, tangible progress over time, um, document resolved issues, energy savings, or something else. How do you document the progress in your platform? Absolutely. So we'll jump in. The best spot for that is going to be the action center. Um, one thing I didn't mention about the action center is action items are never deleted. They can only be closed or blocked. Um, now, again, I, I won't be able to show you the customer, but we actually use this as for to help with commissioning punch lists where they have transferred the commissioning punch list into the action items under the work log. And then as they get ticked off, they can get into the closed action items, which then allows people to still view them and to see if they're still currently repaired or whatever's happening. Um, but also the blocked action item is a cool component because if you, if you can't take on an activity due to a need for a shutdown or whatever the case may be, um, any item within the action center when you view it, if it's assigned to you, you have the option to then block it. You can say, okay, funding. And then you can say, all right, well, we're going to get a new budget for this in May. So let's go ahead and open the calendar and we'll switch this over to May and say, okay, this will be blocked until May. And then what happens is that action then moves from the work log into the blocked actions. Um, but the reason that nobody can delete them is because we wanted to have just that, the running log of what's actually happening within a building. Um, and just like I mentioned before with the links, even though this link is in, this is probably a phony thing because I just made it for some students. But yeah, because it took me over to this other one. Um, but I, I, even with the link, uh, you can update the dates and the times to see if the action was still correct. But I apologize for looking at that one because that's not one that has anything that you can actually look at. But that's that's probably the best oh, component right. way that you'd do it. Okay. Related to that, mm -hmm. can you output faults into a... CM, CMMS system, you know, computerized maintenance management system. Is there a way to do that? There is. We have APIs for it, um, but it requires development. So it's not something where I would tell you we're going to go and create a, a connection via API to every CMMS system out there. Um, but when we run into organizations that um, you know are large enough, we're going to utilize it. 
and especially if they have uh, the access to a knowledgeable team on the end of the CMS programmer or software developer, then we can build that connector. Um, so it's one of those things that we don't have currently implemented, uh, but we do have an open API that allows for it. And it is something that we're actually going to be working on in this next year with Chicago Public Schools. Okay, so that's related to another question um, that has been asked, which is, um, this, that sounds like you know some customized programming would be required. So can you talk about your business model? Um, this is a it's a service for sa uh, services sale, um, so, uh, licensing, and then there's additional kind of programming. There's time and materials. How do, how do you yeah how do you charge for the service? So there's a couple of different ways. Our 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 end game is a pure SaaS company. Um, in order to get there, we still have SaaS with managed services. So we're, we're software as a service. Um, and then we have managed services as well that will help support uh, implementation, adoption, things like that. Um, but really where we, where we find the most success and the success that we're after is that our main customers are going to be uh, controls contractors, the people that are operating the BAS within the building, um, because they typically have right off the bat the greatest understanding of it. Uh, a good relationship with most of the buildings that we've that we've been dealing with, um, and so the goal, the way that we see ourselves kind of going to market uh, more consistently in the future is that we would be purchased by controls contractors or vendors and utilized as a tool by them uh, that they would then you know apply onto a building. Um, so they would take on the labor and the installation. And you're right that there is a labor and installation component. But the reason that we believe we're going to be successful like this is because our, our uh, labor component for an integration of a basic building, what I call our base configuration, which is everything that you would see here, including these same reports, um, it's a one to two hour integration activity. And that's not an exaggeration. That is exactly how long it takes. And it's actually typically less than that as long as somebody understands what the building point names are. Um, it's also repeatable. We have a guide for it that shows that process, exactly how you do it and exactly how you get these results. Um, so I, I, I hate struggling with answering this question, but it's one of those things where there's, there's kind of market multiple ways that we can go to market where with Chicago public schools, we work directly with, with CPS to, uh, to, to, to work with them, to apply the, pro the product. And we have a, an engineer from our staff that is going to be supporting it alongside them for a year while they get adoption and training and all of that stuff. We have other customers where they are just a contractor and all we do is we provide them with the software as a service. And then their business model is to take that into their customer where they charge a small margin and then they use the outputs to benefit uh, discussions around strategy. Um, as a matter of fact, today, somebody, I think one of the questions was brought up around validation. We had a, 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 a customer that was happy they were able to show their customer that a reheat repair they made on Monday worked. And it was very obvious because you saw the discharge air temp low, you saw what time the technician came in and that reheat started firing up and, and they started getting an improved space temperature. Um, so, you know, there, there's it, there's kind of a lot of different ways that, that people can benefit from the data. So I hate seeing it in the way that it's like anybody that would kind of get us into buildings and get data as a focal point for operations would really be our market. Um, but I guess that's kind of what it is, in all honesty. Okay, let's move on. We got a couple more questions, and then I'm going to pose a couple, and we'll wrap up. Um, how do you prioritize different faults or different um, pieces of equipment um, that need maintenance? Yeah. So is there a prioritization uh, built in. The 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 prioritization is minimal. Um, we don't have a way to prioritize analytic faults by saying this is a severe or a light or a minor. Um, where that's actually happening first for us is going to be within our reports. Uh, it won't be for about three weeks, but we are creating uh, right now. These reports are, are static in the sense that they all have the same level of priority. Uh, we're creating a priority array that will then allow somebody to say, OK, this report's more important. So this score is going to have bigger weight on the ROS. Um, but as far as analytics go, we don't have a way to prioritize that. It, well, this is one of those things, Ryan, where you could get really roundabout in saying it, where you could be like, well, you could create a custom dashboard that has all the rules and analytics that you actually care about. Um, but I think the most honest answer is to just say, no, we do not have uh, a fault prioritization. Okay. 
last question and I have a couple of my own. Um, do you work communicate with BAS contractors to improve data collection process such as uh, change a point name, add point name, change data point, download, interval, frequency, et cetera. Do you manage these things on your side? Not typically. We have some base recommendations, but the way our product works is really as long as the data can go out of the BAS, we can ingest it and handle it kind of any way. And maybe I guess maybe I should better answer that question um, because there's plenty of ways that you can manipulate it if you want to. Um, so if you wanted to change point names, if you wanted to change what equipment it's located under, if you wanted to change all those types of things, any of that kind of stuff can be handled within what's called our site editor, um, where it allows you a lot of those different kinds of capabilities. Um, so there are, there are components where you can do that. Um, but I think that it's, uh, I, um, I, uh, we don't really, what I want to say is we don't manage it. We have some recommendations. We recommend that like history extensions be placed on everything to avoid uh, uh, data gaps in case your BAS goes down. We recommend that like things like Boolean points get a COV history extension where numeric points get a 15 minute interval extension. Things like that we recommend, um, but we don't require any of it. Uh, and, and again, it's the same thing around like, yeah, naming and, and point names and stuff like that. Um, we have all of our recommendations within our, our instructional guides around what we think makes the easiest and what makes the most sense. Um, but really at the end of the day, if it comes from the BAS and it can get out of the BAS and show up as a file path in our software, we can manipulate it and do whatever we need to with it. So folks, if you have questions, uh, please submit them. We're wrapping up here in the next five minutes or so. Um, so one of the questions I've been posing Stephen, with these demonstrations is for um, the speakers to share an implementation challenge you experienced with your platform that was the basis of a, of a product improvement feature. Yeah, actually, I want to uh, uh, back for a quick second because it'll actually, actually be able to show it. Let me just roll way down up, way up here. All right. It is all right. Here it is. Again, these slides are in the, the slides that uh, Stephen's sharing are in the dashboard. So this was our implementation challenge, the Jace. Uh, we prefer to do software-only connectors. We so actually in this in this case, um, we wanted to eliminate a full day of integration. Uh, so we currently have the connectors I mentioned: Niagara, Dezigo CC, Finn, and KMC Commander. This organization is primarily using Allerton. Uh, well, we happen to have, we know how to build connectors. So what we are doing to remove this problem is we're actually working with an Allerton representative now to develop an Allerton connector. So that way this customer no longer has to add that JACE overlay and they can simply use our software connector to virtually connect into their building sets. So we wanted, because we wanted to be able to remove that additional cost and that additional labor. Um, and so we're able to do that, which I think is a, a pretty cool, uh, a pretty cool thing. Good example. My last question again, folks, if you're sitting on a question, please submit it. Um, otherwise, we'll wrap up after this uh, last question, which is I, I also want speakers to share the um, new features that are in development with your with the yeah. platform. So what's what's coming? What's on the horizon? So, like I mentioned, the uh, ability to prioritize reports is on the near horizon. It's two to three weeks away. Um, and what that's going to allow is if IQ scorecard is not something you're concerned about, you can make that a low priority, which will remove its ROS and remove its uh, its pulling off the the overall ROS. Um, additional improvements that we are currently working on are root cause improvement. Um, we find that root cause has become very helpful for technicians. So we're building that out further to say not only what is the root cause, but also who do you need to contact for remediation or what type of skills that you have to have. So if you see high DAT causing air stratification, you might need programming uh, skills. You might need a couple of these others. Uh, so the, the real product build out is all gonna be geared around uh, um, the, the goal of allowing the reports to be used as metrics and KPIs within the buildings, and then giving better uh, rectification uh, results for, uh, for general users, um, really trying to eliminate as much of the guesswork as we can. 
that that's where our, our primary focus is going to be. And then the one that's constantly happening is developing new connectors. Um, whenever we run into a situation, just like we did with our past customer, we want to look into ways that we can connect more easily. Great. I don't see, oh, there is another question here. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I, I asked that one. Um, so I think we're ready to wrap up. If um, you have anything you wanna share, please type it in. Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your platform today, Stephen, and for taking um, all the questions. Absolutely. Um, I'll let you sort of have the final word in a minute, but just a reminder for the attendees, we have another demonstration tomorrow to next week, and the recordings for these are, are starting to show up on our on-demand platform. Um, the handouts, the slides that Stephen shared are in the handouts link. And thanks for attending today. Those are my notes. And with that, Stephen, any final word? Um, no, I, I just really appreciate everybody taking the time. I really appreciate the questions. It's great to get intelligent questions like that. And uh, anybody can feel free to reach out to me in any way if they have any additional questions. But thanks very much for the opportunity. Yeah, I will just uh, acknowledge that Stephen's uh, contact information is included in the slide deck. So if you want to grab that if you have questions for him in the future.